Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know it is the last session of the day, so hopefully you're all still awake, caffeinated. So, let's see. Um, so yes, we're, we're here to talk uh, to you about how we are already using Rust in the kernel um, via, via eBPF. Uh, so I'm Dave, uh, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I am not a kernel developer. Um, I am more of a systems-y type of developer, developing networking things uh, on top. I'm Michal, uh, I work at DeepFence, and uh, I'm known as Wadolowski on GitHub, Twitter, and uh, Discord. All right, so, controversial statement. Uh, <clears throat> we know that you're not trying to rewrite the kernel in Rust, um, but, you know, it, it's at least becoming a second-class option. Uh, or uh, another language in which you'll be able to, to use to write kernel modules, drivers, all of those good things. You all know that. Um, who's familiar with BPF? Show hands in the room. Fantastic. All right. Well, that's good. Um, so you, you probably all know that BPF is starting to eat away at the kernel. Uh, so we see that there are two things that are happening. You know, Rust is becoming a, an option for drivers and modules, but also BPF is happening. Um, and we see that there is definitely room to collaborate uh, between what's happening with Rust on Linux and what's happening in the BPF space as well. Um, so talking about how BPF is eating the kernel, um, there are already drivers in the kernel that are BPF based. So IR decoding for LIRC mode two programs is BPF based. There are too many different ways of decoding IR. So having BPF programs to do that means the number of entry drivers that are required is you know, very, very small, and all of the weird stuff can happen in BPF. Uh, the HID subsystem maintainers have come to the same type of conclusion, that there are generic HID drivers that are great, but for all of these other cases, maybe BPF is a really good solution. Um, so we see you know, a lot of subsystems starting to extend themselves with BPF, uh, BPF being able to you know, replace drivers and maybe even modules in some cases. Um, but this is an ecosystem which is very heavily dominated by C. Uh, BPF uh, programs are written in a restricted type of C or a safer type of C that offers uh, memory safety guarantees because uh, BPF programs have a verifier which is going to verify that you're working in a way which isn't going to panic the kernel. So definitely Rust isn't going to help you gain memory safety there. What we feel it does give you is a lot of things up uh, ahead of time. So the verifier is only going to stop you at load time when you come to do something. As a developer, you want that feedback at compile time uh, so that you can find out that, oh, no, actually, that's, uh, that's not a great thing that I was trying to do. And you can correct before you go through the expense of compile, load into the kernel, uh, all those other types of good things. Um, so yes, uh, Mikhail's gonna tell you a bit about Aya. So yeah. Um... Before I explain how Aya works and uh, what is it, uh, I would like to explain the difference between how eBPF is compiled uh, from C to eBPF ELF object. So the classic scenario, the most popular one, is that uh, there is one source code file and a lot of headers. So we end up with one big source file with includes. And then we use CLANG. Uh, with uh, minus C option, which means explicitly skipping the linking phase, and we get the eBPF object file. And the reason why th uh, it's done like that is that LD and LD can't link eBPF object files. Uh, there was there were some patch sets to LD to make it happen, but they never made it upstream. So. Uh, but nowadays, uh, with libpf and bpf2, linking is possible. It's still not a popular solution. Uh, as far as I know, the, yeah, the only open source project which does that, which uses bpf2 for linking multiple eBPF object files is systemd. But uh, with bpf2 get object, it's possible to produce, for example, this uh, fw.o file uh, from uh, the program uh, from the program object, uh, which contains the main program function and some library object, which, for example, can contain some map definitions or some common functions to be used. 
Uh, and well, here I'm going to explain in general um, how compilation and thinking in Rust works. So usually we have some libraries, some library crates, which we are using as dependencies in the final binary crate. And um, web, uh, the library is built to the lib file, which is basically an archive which contains the object file inside. And then while compiling binary crate, um, Rust by default uses LD or LLD to link the uh, final application binary object and um, depending library objects together and make the um, app executable. But uh, yeah, I mentioned previously that LD and LD can't link um, can't link a BPF. And also we started working on AIA and on writing eBPF in Rust way before BPF2 and libbpf uh, were able to link uh, BPF objects. So we came with our own linker, which is called B, uh, BPF linker. So the schema is almost the same as the previous one, but the difference is that uh, we are compiling everything, both libraries and binaries, uh, to the BPF target and um, yeah, so we end up with, for example, a common crate with some common structures. Um, we compile it to the Erlib uh, Rust library and then we link it with BPF linker instead of LLD to the eBPF object file. And that's also very important that uh, our IRBPF library, which contains the common skeletons for writing EPPF programs, is also a separate crate. So, uh, yeah, by design, uh, while using AI and using Rust, we are not including header files, like you see, but every dependency, including the core library of AI, is um, a crate, which we link statically. Yeah, it's probably also worth noting that uh, BPF is a tier three target in the Rust compiler, so that's how we're able to uh, how we're able to you know compile down to, to BPF bytecode in the first place. And well, BPF linker can uh, get any input which contains LLVM bitcode, so. BPF linker is able to take uh, .bc file as an, as an input, uh, .a archive or lib archive, as long as the objects file uh, object files inside them uh, have embedded uh, bitcode. But the usual way of doing things, so usually when you have some depending crates uh, in your eBPF program, the usual way is going from lib, getting object file from it, uh, then BPF linker linking it together with the uh, with the main um, object file and then producing the final uh, eBPF object file containing everything. And here we go to overall AI ecosystem. So usually eBPF projects are separated into two parts. So there is a user space part which is uh, loading BPF programs into the kernel and then managing them, managing their life cycle, um, writing data to BPF maps, receiving data from uh, perf buffers and ring buffers. And there is a um, BPF program living in the kernel land in the uh, BPF virtual machine. Uh, and for user land, the compilation is like a classic Rust compilation. So, you know, the user land binary is, um, yeah, the usual x86-64 or uh, ARM64 binary, and uh, we can just use uh, Rust stable uh, with LD or LD to do that. But yeah, in, it's different in the BPF part. Here comes Rusty nightly because, uh, well, the BPF target still didn't make it to this table Rust yet, and so uh, BPF linker is used. Uh, and uh, AI comes with uh, the main library, which is called just AI in user land and AI B B e I BPF uh, for, uh, for BPF programs. So these two crates, AI contains like definitions of programs and maps. Um, 
time with AI BPF to, uh, for BPF programs. There is AI log, which is the library which lets, uh, which allows us to uh, push uh, logs from BPF programs for perm buffers uh, to the user space. And uh, there is also tooling around AI. Uh, the first of them is AI template, which lets you to create uh, the, your new AI-based project without writing boilerplate code yourself. And uh, there is also AI tool, which takes care of creating bindings to the kernel structures. Uh, and overall features of AI are uh, support for compi uh, compiled ones, uh, ones run everywhere, but only in user space. So for now, uh, when you have AI in user space, you can load programs built with libbpf, and we support uh, uh, support the relocations, but we still need to work uh, on supporting BTF, uh, uh, emitting BTF and uh, Corey uh, in the BPF side, but we'll talk about that in details later. Uh, as I mentioned, we have IALOC, which uses pair buffers for logging. And uh, I think it's very really cool because uh, we are not really using BPF print K in AI, so we are not pushing logs to the trace log of the kernel, but we are rather pushing them, pushing all the logs directly to the user space process which is really cool, especially if you write some cloud native application in Kubernetes, and then you can just cube cattle log and see all the logs which are coming from the kernel space. And we support async, so the user, so the user space crate, the user space part of the project can be based on Tokyo and async STD. In fact, when you create a new project uh, with AYA templates, it by default is using Tokyo. And well, AI is used by DeepFence uh, for network observability, uh, by Exain for IoT observability, uh, Parka, um, which is a cloud native um, code profiler, and by Red Hat for BPFD, which is a daemon for managing XDP programs. And uh, well, now let's talk about the uh, benefits of writing eBPF code in Rust. So on the left side, we have a code written in C and we are trying to mix three types of programs here. So we define the section trace point. So we are, so we are telling that, yeah, the, our program is going to be a trace point type. But then we are providing the skbuf argument, which is an argument typical for TC classifiers or uh, other network related uh, type of programs. And we are trying to return the status code of XDP. And because uh, C is not as strongly typed as Rust, we are actually able to compile that code. So. Uh, of course, loading that program into the kernel is going to fail, but it's going to fail during the runtime. But because Rust is so much more strongly typed, and in AI we take care that uh, macros are enforcing proper types and proper arguments, uh, such an attempt of mixing type of programs will, um, yeah, will fail on the compilation phase already. The other thing, the other advantage of uh, writing BPF in Rust is error handling. So on the left side, we have typical way of handling errors in C. So getting the error code and checking whether it's different from zero, whether it's not null. Um, and uh, on the right side, we have Rust with um, the results enum and quotation mark. So the quotation mark is just in case of error, it's, it stops executing the function right there and is um, bumping up uh, the error. And well, in this example, maybe the difference isn't that visible, but when your program becomes bigger, then in C you have all the time, like if error equals something. And in Rust, it's a bit cleaner, like you don't need those if statements all the time. 
and uh, the other advantage of writing um, the whole epf based projects in rust is that you can have a common crate where you share structures and code between kernel and user space so for example if you want to some, uh, store some structure uh, in a BPF map and be able to read it and write it both in user space and eBPF. Uh, yeah, in Rust, you can just create a common crate, which is going to be statically linked both to the eBPF crate and user space crate, and there is no code duplication whatsoever. Uh, while with the uh, writing in C, and especially while mixing uh, BPF programs and C and user space programs in some other languages like Go or even Rust, but you still write um, the um, uh, BPF program in C, then you have pretty much three methods of dealing with um, the common structures. You can either manually copy paste them and make sure they are identical across different languages. You can generate C bindings uh, based on header files, or you can use BTF to inspect these structures in the BPF program and auto-generate this structure. But regardless of um, which of those three methods you are going to choose, there is always that you know, code duplication. And I think that ability of having a common crate which is statically linked is a cooler solution. And also with Rust and AI, we are trying to make sure that the build dependencies are as minimal as possible. So usually when you write um, BPF programs in C, you need to install a VM clunk uh, on your host. Then you need to either install libbpf package if you are fine with having older version or include libbpf as submodule. So yeah, it's um, a bit more over overhead. While in Rust, we are especially on x86 64, we are making sure that having Rust up, cargo, and just installing a bunch of crates is everything you need. So uh, on x86 systems, you don't even need system-wide LLVM installation. Um, AI and BPF linker are able to use the shared LLVM library uh, included with Rust compiler. So yeah, no packages needed. You just need Rust compiler. And well, I mentioned already AI templates. On the right side, you have a screenshot of it. So you can just write cargo generate, GitHub, AI template, and then you are prompted. So you are prompted first for your name of the project. Then you are prompted for choosing the type of program you want to write. And then eventually you have some follow-up questions. So for example, if you choose classifier, you are being asked whether that classifier should uh, inspect ingress or egress traffic. If you are choosing LSM, you are asked for LSM hook you want to attach to and so on and so on. While with C, uh, there is a kind of official repo libbpf bootstrap, which is like an example of how to create uh, a new project with libbpf skeletons. But um, yeah, it's not really auto-generated. You still need to kind of like get inspiration from the repo and craft your own make files yourself and include libbpf as a submodule. So it's a bit harder than in Rust. If now it's your turn. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, one other thing I will mention is that one of the things we've been trying to do in IABPF, the kernel space thing, uh, is we will want to make it as safe, like Rust safe, safe uh, as possible, which requires a lot of work from our side in trying to map uh, any type of guarantees around memory safety that's offered by the kernel in BPF into Rust so that we can offer those safe APIs. As part of that, we've ended up discovering a lot of things which we think, oh, sure, that would be fine. Just insert something into a map. Um, you know, some of these operations are just inherently unsafe. Uh, and they are so from C as well. 
um, because of, of locking and RCU and other various things that you have no control of unless you're using things like spin locks and various other bits and pieces that are coming in BPF. So uh, AYA is also very heavily documented so that when we do have to dip into unsafe, it's clearly called out in the docs as to why an operation is unsafe and why you need to kind of opt into that. Um, anyhow, uh, back on to like, uh, so I think Mikhail has established that, you know, we can and we all do write uh, Rust programs that get compiled down to BPF and loaded in the kernel so we can benefit from, from that today. But they are not without challenges. And I think that some of these challenges might be challenges that affect Rust for Linux too. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about those. Oops. Um, first and foremost uh, is BPF type format, BTF. Um, show of hands, anybody know about BTF? Yes, it does. Yeah, fantastic. All right, brilliant. So BTF, uh, in essence, is a compact debug info format. So take Dwarf, squash it down so it's really, really compact. Um, it's used really heavily inside the uh, inner workings of BPF uh, to enable a lot of features like spin locks that I just mentioned, requires BTF-based map definitions. Certain program types require BTF. Um, you know, it, it's uh, used for providing Cori. It, it's, yeah, used everywhere. Um, one of the things that we are struggling with is that we need to be able to generate BTF uh, debug info effectively for Rust code. Um, we can do that because LVM IR to BTF conversion is already existing. What we're finding, however, is that um, where I have written a program in Rust, uh, I've been able to attach a C program to a function in that in BPF, which is pretty cool, and vice versa. I can write something in C and attach a Rust program to it, also very cool. There are some edge cases where Rust semantics don't actually line up with what is inside BTF because it's been designed to represent C effectively. So we're having to learn on the fly uh, what some of these things are, what some of the assumptions that have been made are so that we can try and come up with either kernel patches or patches into LLVM to try and get BTF to, to work for our use case. Now, why this is important for Rust for Linux is that kernel modules generate BTF and uh, now that gets populated. So if you want to go and attach a, a K probe to a kernel module, you can totally do that. So, but I'm not entirely sure how that gets generated, probably using Parhol or something similar, but something like that for Rust for Linux may indeed need to exist at some point if you want that interoperability with uh, BPF and the BPF subsystem. So I feel like this is a shared problem where hopefully with a little bit of LVM knowledge and Rust-C knowledge and uh, BTF knowledge, we can kind of push our way through that so that it works out for the IA use case and also for Rust for Linux. Um, noting also here, one of the other things which is relatively new uh, in uh, BPF space is the use of certain compiler intrinsics for tracking symbol access. So you can, uh, for example, if you were trying to access a certain field within Tarstruct, um, the compiler will record that and it can emit a relocation so that if that field inside Tarstruct is moved between kernel versions, you can make sure that uh, that gets relocated before it gets loaded in at runtime. Uh, and those intrinsics obviously don't port over to GCC or, or haven't done yet. So LLVM is the BPF compiler. GCC support is being worked on. So we're, there's also you know potential other compiler work there for the GCC folks to kind of catch up with what's happening inside um, LLVM. Um, all right, the other problem that we have it's not really a problem, it's more of an annoyance, uh, is working with kernel types um, from Rust, which is not fun. Um, the main reason is, uh, as a network programmer, uh, I'm playing around with stuff like SK and sockets, and socket is full of anonymous unions, and BindGen doesn't understand the macros that are written inside the kernel for accessing things like destination address, which is nested two anonymous unions deep. Um, so it's little things like that that mean that we have to use a whole bunch of bind gen generated anonymous types and, and kind of track that one down to access the fields we want, and it's just not, not nice. Um, so it would be great if we can find a way of making that better somehow. Um, I'm not sure. I just want to raise that with you all because you've got way more experience than I do. 
and hopefully that's something that we can uh, we can learn from. Um, yes. Um, all right. So I think that brings us around to uh, question time. Comment from Finn in the chat. Rustup sometimes has problems in some boxes, so for distros like NixOS, Rusty, and Cargo, instructions should be provided, as Rustup does not work. Uh, I was in the middle of your presentation, I think, on speaking about the... Oh, right, the, the dependencies, for, yeah. right, yeah. So ultimately, our dependencies are on having Rust stable and Rust nightly. So that can come from Rustup, or it can come from your package manager. It's really up to you. I don't suppose you have like an example hello world program you could show us real quick. I'm as not on this computer. If I connected mine, I could show you, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, say I don't think the example you've got here is particularly easy to to pass yeah, as a hello the, world. The, the code on the right is an example of the program which actually works. So. That's literally it. And yeah, the, like, the, the compilation for that is. Uh, except imports, like the, uh, of course, we cut it off like the lines of using and create, but uh, yeah, that's much the body of the code. So at the beginning, you have the um, definition of the hash map for storing PIDs. Then you have the main function of the BPF program, which is F entry attached to the kernel clone function. So it gets triggered every time the kernel clone function uh, in the kernel is uh, called. And then in the body of try kernel clone function, which exists to, uh, mostly to be wrapped in a result uh, for error handling, we are getting the PID uh, from the context and we are sa uh, saving that PID in the hash map. A simple trigger program, but... Uh, and you would be able to for example, say get rid of the unsafe block if you wrapped PIDs in a mutex or the hash map in a mutex. Uh, uh, wait, that not no? quite, no, because BPF maps are, are a little bit strange um, in that there are variants that are per CPU, which we might be able to be uh, uh, safe for, but there are also variants that are not per CPU, and therefore, if the same program is getting executed on different CPUs, then you know. It, depending on scheduling, we don't actually know which program is going to grab what and when. Um, spin locks do help with that, but we, we just don't have support for those inside IA just yet because of BTF. Um, we, we need BTF-based map definitions, but we can't generate BTF without LLVM seg faulting at the moment, so we're sort of <laughs> Okay, got, in the middle. gotcha. So it's, uh, it's not something that can be enforced by the Rust compiler, and so you, you have to rep Right. So we not, and since it's a normal hash map which can be shared across CPUs, it's not spread. It, it's not safe. So if if I were you, to wrap it, you can it, have nice conditions here. Gotcha. If if I were to wrap it in a in a um, mutex, there would probably be some compilation error. In that case you, because you specifically like a static mut and. Yeah. Something to do with the proc macro there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we we've actually got rid of having to use static mut now. So okay. we're now at the point that they can just be static, which is fine. Um, or well, at least slightly better than static mut. Um, but yeah, there there are a lot of strange strange guarantees that we have to try and uh, honor from what's happening in the kernel because like ultimately the kernel is going to be doing a lot of things that we have as BPF just running in a, a small VM with very small stack space and you know we, we have very limited visibility into what's happening elsewhere so we can be given a pointer and we don't know whether the data at that pointer is absolutely valid or whether somebody from user space has inserted something into the same map and now the pointer's garbage because we just literally don't know. So yeah, we're trying to make the API as safe as practical, but ultimately with a lot of this BPF stuff, eventually we, we have to dip into unsafe. And with our BTF, we can have nice things. Yes. <laughs> I, have, I have one quick question. Um, is, is the information that, um, so you said there were different types of, of maps, Yes. right? Uh, are these decided at runtime or like, wouldn't it be possible for you to have different interfaces for these different types of, of maps? 
and then make the thing safe? Um, because that, that's sort of the approach we, we try to do. We try to like, if, if you want to write a module that uh, only works for mutex-based uh, maps, mm -hmm. for example, this is an option, right? And then if you try to attach it to something that is not mutex-based, then it just fails, right? Say this is not uh, supported. And with something like that, we can make it uh, safe. Or, or try to do th things like these on, on the Rust for Linux uh, project. Another thing, uh, and it's just a quick suggestion, uh, we try to do is when we do have unsafe, we require that the function be documented with the safety requirements, yeah. right? And then the usage as well. So we would have required uh, people here to do like safety colon, this is safe because so and so is, is, is on. We, we are literally doing the same thing with our documentation. So making sure that in the library, every function which is unsafe has a safety section as to explaining exactly why that is and then also encouraging users to do the same. We don't want the use of unsafe to, to happen lightly. Um, but you know, to, you, to your point on mutex-based things, I think we're really stuck at the moment um, with a, a, a few little bits of, of quirks of working with uh, BPF and, and Rust-C. So we don't yet have atomic instructions. We can't do sort of atomics, uh, which is a bit of a blocker uh, for some of the, the mutexes. And also, um, yeah, like we said before, BTF, which is where we get the spin lock in the, uh, to protect the, the values in the map. You know, we, we can't do that yet either. So once we have those things, we can totally refine the API and try and make that better. But you know, we're still, things are still evolving. Uh, well then. You still have similar restrictions in the, the validation, like for example, bounded loops. Um, in it, like, are you still on the on this on the the kernel side? Uh, are you still having to write bounded loops and that kind of stuff that the verifier would then go and verify? Yes, it's exactly the same. Exactly so the same. it goes through the same verifier, and yeah, you need to okay, put gotcha. bounds when you. Look. I didn't know if we were bypassing any of that. <laughs> just, no, no, uh, we'd love to. Gotcha. No, we we can't. Yeah, we we still have to try and make. We can offer that. better guarantees. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't think the BPF subsystem maintainers would be happy with if we did that. So right, I, no, I we, we, we play by the same rules, right? Um, yeah. It's just so different. <laughs> <laughs> Someone there has a question, yeah. Okay, then maybe the last, probably. So, um, yeah, I found that comment very um, difficult to understand when you said that you needed BTF for something that you wrote in Rust C. So typically, B, you know, debug information is used to reflect something that's written in a higher level language to, you know, to the user. So in this case, if you write, BTF is just not ready to convey what the programming language, what, what you're trying to say in, const in just C constructs, right? So how is that going to come around? Like, how, why is that an expectation? Is the, because BTF is not ready, right? Semantics-wise, it just cannot reflect what um, Rust C as a language allows you to do. So the constructs and everything, they cannot be, um, you cannot have debug information for Rust C. So in BTF, e, mm, well, <laughs> so I guess in writing a lot of uh, in writing the BPF programs that we're writing, um, ultimately we are kind of in like Rust, but for FFI type of territory. So everything we, we end up dealing with a lot of stuff which has a C-based memory layout anyway. Uh, Oftentimes, if we need to have data and store it in a map, it all needs to be refer C or something similar anyway. Uh, so ultimately, it becomes a very C-ish dialect of Rust. So we do actually get some meaningful BTF generated because of that. But obviously, there are some other cases like enums uh, where you know Rust enums are much more descriptive than C ones, where we can have data and in, invariants and, and other pieces that you, you can't necessarily map cleanly from C. So in those cases, that's when we end up segfaulting LLVM because it just does not know 
what to do with this or how to generate BTF in that way. So I think what we're going to end up with is probably a set of guardrails uh, within, you know, if you're writing BPF programs in Rust, you get all of this expressibility, but yeah. under these constraints. Yeah. Um, and I think we can certainly look at extending BTF to have new types if we feel like it's something which is really useful. But ultimately, it's got to be something which is always C compatible because you know there, there is already a thriving C-based ecosystem of BPF tooling. Uh, you know, and we, we have program types that are able to extend or run at the entry point of uh, existing functions which are in the kernel. So if we add functions or we add trace points, you know, we ourselves might need to be able to be traced by BPF programs because uh, you can go BPF all the way down. So yeah, we, we need to make sure that whatever we're whatever we're expressing, the footprint of our program is pretty much C compatible for the most part, or a C program could figure out how to talk to us. I guess also at some point I was wondering what is the debug info for Rust? We have some directions in that, in that or? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I know it gets generated and I know it's in, uh, LLVM's able to read it, but I don't know what the, what the exact format is. Uh, Alessandro, who is our uh, LLVM whisperer and added the, the Rust C target is probably the best person to answer that question, but uh, fortunately he's not here. But I'll uh, 